G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. We are now a few hours removed. It's still the same day for me as the Brownlow medal because uh, obviously I'm here in the UK. Uh, but just sort of reflecting on the Lockie Neal Brownlow win and it's interesting to me, I don't actually remember this much backlash for the Brownlow medal night um, in recent history in terms of how many people are kind of upset by the fact that Lockie Neal's won it. And also coming up with plenty of examples of uh, really inconsistent and very questionable awarding of votes throughout the season. So I thought today in this video, what we'll do is try and go th back through some of the uh, the most questionable Brownlow vote decisions in this video and just highlight them and discuss them. Because uh, to be fair, while I don't like undermining Lockie Neal and his Brownlow medal win, some of the decisions made on who gets three, two and one votes in particular games was very, very questionable. So I've been a bit doing a bit of digging you know, online and even using the comments section of the last video that I uploaded on that Lockie Neal winning the brown low. So if you go back through here, um, you know, someone points out Horn Francis polling three votes in round 14. Uh, says it's a Mickey Mouse MVP award. Dom Sheed, three votes versus the Pies. Uh, he did have a really good game, but I think Dacos also kicked three goals that game. And I, I get it when your team loses by 11 goals. Um, it's a little bit questionable. Uh, Bont was robbed. Uh, somebody points out Byron says that uh, to not win All-Australian and then win the Brown Low is a little bit questionable. I, uh, I suppose the All-Australian is still a... Um, subjective thing but the metal pig says he doesn't generally care who wins the brown low but neil's win felt wrong he thought the bond was robbed and that the three votes he got against gws where cameron kicked seven it seems like a massive oversight so yeah that's what we're going to do in this video we're going to go through some of the examples of really poor decisions then uh burning Ghidorah says that in uh, round 14 jason horn francis had 13 disposals seven clangers four frees against, and won three Brownlow medal votes. That one is probably one of the most absurd I've ever seen. Somehow Nick Dacos polled zero votes from a 41 disposal game. Uh, yes, I saw someone else clarify that he also had 12 kickouts on that game, so it was probably more like 27, 29 disposals, rather. I don't know, I don't remember the game in question, but maybe that was why. And then, yeah, Mike Panny also points out 42 and two, got uh, Errol Goulden one vote in the final round. So they did lose that game, so we'll, we'll see. Let's go have a look at the stats at some of these games. Okay, so this one is not relevant to the eventual winner, obviously. In round two, Jeremy Cameron is only awarded, uh, awarded one vote for this performance of six goals and 25 possessions. The two guys who beat him were Kerno, who got two votes, and Saad, who got three votes as well. To kick six goals and have 25 possessions, I know they lost the game, but surely Jeremy Cameron is stiff to only get one vote in that. Then in, in round two, Joel Amati gets uh, four goals and uh, 11 possessions, admittedly, no, that's it, just the one mark. Admittedly played really well in that game, but subbed off at half time. And you consider who else played well in this game. Logan McDonald kicked five goals. That one is a little bit questionable. I know that Amati played well, but uh, interesting. Then you've got the round three clash between Collingwood and Richmond. This is another interesting one here. So Jordan Degoe does not get a single vote for 35 touches and 600 meters gained. Uh, in what is a pretty solid performance. There are nine clearances, and then you go down to uh, who actually got three votes. It was all the way down here. I've sorted it by fantasy points. But Taylor Adams got three votes for this game, which is ridiculous. He had three contested possessions, uh, 20 touches in general, just for 59 fantasy points. How does that justify three votes? Again, I know I'm not watching the game, but that is a huge difference in output. Round four is another questionable one. This is where the Lions beat the Pies at the Gabba. Nick Dacos has two goals and 38 possessions, uh, 633 meters gained. Lockie Neal got a vote for this. Nick Dacos did not. Where is Lockie Neal? in this one 22 touches and admittedly seven clearances but again a little bit weird you would have thought that Dacos would have probably and deservedly should have got a vote for this game sweet so now we're at round five uh, Fremantle is playing the Gold Coast Suns and uh, the performance here by Caleb Sarong is really interesting 37 disposals uh, no votes in this game but you scroll down to Andy Brayshaw he got one vote for one goal and 18 possessions. Admittedly, six clearances. But how many clearances did uh, Sarong get? Eight. So it's starting to really... We're starting to see real holes in, in the way that these umpires are adjudicating these games. This one is one of the more contentious ones. Uh, this is where the Lions beat the Giants uh, back in round six of this season. Now, Lockie Neal gets three votes for this performance. And he has... Uh, where is Lockie Neal? I have to keep scrolling down because it's sorted by a fantasy point. So he has 20 touches, 13 handballs, only seven kicks. Charlie Cameron literally had as many goals as uh, Lockie Neal had kicks in this game. Where is Charlie Cameron? Seven goals from 15 touches. So not even a big difference in the amount of disposals won in this game. And Charlie Cameron didn't get the three votes. I'm not sure exactly what he got, but we know that Lockie Neal got three for this game. Now we're up to round nine. Collingwood hosting the GWS Giants at the uh, MCG, it would have been. Yep, there you go. So I believe that the three-vote performance here 
didn't go to you know Tom Mitchell with 36 disposals or Dugowie with 31. This is another game where Taylor Adams, who is down here with 20 touches, and again, just the seven kicks, just sort of like Neil before, he got two votes for this game, and Jordan Dugowie did not get a single one. And I think also Dacos was not awarded three votes in this game, or even, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not too sure exactly what Dacos did poll in this game, but I believe he didn't poll at all, which is a little bit surprising. Like I said, 12 kick-ins, but that's still better output than all the other players on the field. Now we're up to round 10, Hawthorne versus West Coast uh, in a game that I really wanted to forget ever existed. But uh, interestingly here, I remember Mitch Lewis kicked six goals and had 24 touches, eight marks, an outstanding forward performance, doesn't get a vote, not a single one. Then to use another West Coast example, this is uh, skipping ahead to round 12 now. Uh, this game, Dom Sheed famously gets uh, 43 touches, 10 clearances, and a goal for three votes. I, I know that I'm an Eagles fan, but I'm, I think that's not too unreasonable, okay? So he, the team got belted, but that is some seriously good output. But I would have thought, you know, Nick Dacos with three goals and 30 touches also would have been a serious chance. Then we're at round 14, Port Adelaide versus Geelong. Now, this is one of the most heinous examples of, uh, I, again, I don't really know who got votes two and one off the top of my head, but I do know that Jason Horn Francis got three votes for this game when you consider Houston had 31, uh, Rosie had 25, uh, who else is there? Finn Lason kicked a bag of four, Zach Butters one and 23. You got to go all the way down here to Jason Horn Francis. Where is he? All the way down here with 13 touches. He had... Something like seven clangers in this game too. Like, it doesn't make any sense. I do feel like there was one game, and Power fans can correct me if I'm wrong, but there was one game where I think Horn Francis had a quiet first half and had a really big third term and helped turn the tide, so I presume that's what this game was. But either way, you can't justify that. That's a terrible decision. Then you've got Errol Golden here as well. Like, when the when he was still a chance to win overall, obviously Neil uh, would have won it either way had Golden got the three votes for this game. But two goals and 42 possessions, despite it being a loss, it wasn't a big loss. To have two and 42, his career best game, uh, for, well, nearly 600 meters gained, four clearances, to not get more than one vote. Look, I know this is subjective, but that is very stiff. And finally, just skipping back here to round 17, this is another game that's been highlighted that Petrarca didn't even get a single vote. Uh, to be fair, statistically, there are some pretty good numbers here, Rowan Marshall, Jack Steele, Wanganeen Miller, uh, but Petrarca did have four and 20. Where is he? Four goals and 20 possessions. So that was a, you know, I, I can't really make a strong case for it, but that is one that's being talked about as uh, one that really would have been costly. Obviously, Petrarca got very close to winning the whole thing. So, so that, that's just a bunch of examples of, uh, you know, decisions of of the umpires on who to give votes to that are pretty hard to explain away. Of course, this is subjective, but I think some of those were genuine real howlers and it does bring into question the integrity of the Brownlow medal. And I've been saying for years that I honestly think the best award that we have is the AFL uh, Coaches Association votes. They coaches do a really, really good job of identifying who's done a really good job. So that kind of opens the floor a little bit to forwards and defenders a bit more. I think it still does tend to be a uh, midfielders award, but it does a better job of it, and I do think the coaches are better placed than the umpires to adjudicate who is the best on ground. Look, the um, the reaction to Neil winning has been borderline disrespectful. Uh, some people make good points. You know, he wasn't uh, all Australian this year, and he probably wasn't the best player this year. You have to go back earlier this year. There were articles about how Neil had actually dropped off in form compared to previous seasons. I, for one, would like to see a future where the Brownlow voting is taken away from umpires. I know that that probably won't happen because it's so deeply rooted in the tradition of the game, but I really don't think umpires are a uh, good person to really adjudicate who is the best on the field. As you can see, historically, they're very, very biased towards those who win a lot of clearances. Yeah, you know, off the top of my head, Lockie Neal's won two recently. Fife was a clearance king. Uh, Patrick Cripps, Ollie Wines, even Matt Prittis in 2014. It's clear where the votes go, and uh, sometimes, uh, particularly this year, it feels very questionable. So, uh, like I said, not trying to undermine Lockie Neal. Congratulations on the win. Happy to see him have it. But when you go through and go through some of the games like that, it is a little bit hard to stomach. But anyway, guys, let me know your thoughts and comments. I think you've been pretty vocal about it so far, as has the broader AFL community online, but nonetheless, still good to hear from you and maybe name some games that I missed out there. We'll be back soon with the uh, AFL content. My AFL Grand Final preview will be coming out probably tomorrow by the time you watch this so stay tuned for that uh, i've been doing heaps of content today i think did three videos out yesterday and maybe a couple more each day for the rest of the season so it's good to be doing this lots of fun i'm enjoying the support i really appreciate it and i'll see you in the next video guys cheers